Today I wanted to reflect a little bit about where we've been. And uh, we've come a long way from chickens and eggs, you know? Chickens crossing the road, cross the balance, cross the balancing feedback loop because they get wiped out, you know? Uh, we've gone from chickens and eggs to the commodity system. Uh, and uh, I just want to look back. The first week of class, uh, I asked you to read some stuff about um, the caves, you know, and the little hand climbing things in the, uh, in the Mesa Verde and, or the, uh, uh, the, the caves in the American Southwest. Uh, and we become what we practice. So what I've tried to do is give you some opportunities to practice systems thinking uh, in class, in discussions, uh, on Blackboard, in lots of ways, in readings, to practice systems thinking. Because this is a way of reprogramming your brain a little bit to start to see things and seeing connections in more complex ways than simply linear fashion of simple cause and effect. So we, we read a little bit from Paul Crafell on, uh, on seeing nature and uh, got started. We went immediately to mental models. You know, what are the underlying reasons that we do what we do? And we played around with the five whys. And we read that book, uh, Three Stories of Our Time, from Active Hope, Joanna Macy. Uh, the um, business as usual, uh, the great unraveling and the great turning as mental models that result in different kinds of behaviors and different kinds of structures. Uh, we looked at the iceberg and looked at where do we find root causes? Where can we find leverage for change? And the deeper levels of the iceberg is that of creating new systems and mental models that create those systems. Uh, and we often just react to events. Uh, and we, nothing ever changes if you simply react to a reaction. Um, the don't think of an elephant um, reframing tool was a way of trying to shift, um, shift the conversation, reframe a conversation uh, to based on your own mental models. And I suggest you take the iceberg and turn it upside down. Start with beliefs, mental models, things that are powerful that we can agree on, and talk about reasonable change options, things that are structures. We've been talking about um, farmers' markets and changes in policy and these kind of things. And share hopeful stories as a way of reframing things, talking about the things that are working in our lives, and then proposing an action or a simple e event, something can be done. A way of reframing. We spent some time looking at structures. You know, these are physical things, organizations, policies, and rituals. Like that recycling bin over there with the physical thing, but allows us to recycle. Changing those structures is where we get the most, we get uh, the most systems change. We change structures by shifting mental models, and when the structures change, behavior changes. And so we looked at those. We played it, then we, then we waded into one of the systems tools, uh, uh, the, the, the feedback loops, the, uh, the simple feedback loops, a reinforcing feedback loop, which is a plus or an R, a, 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 a balancing feedback loop, which is a minus or a B, and chickens crossing roads uh, reduce the number of chickens. So as eggs increase, chickens increase. But as chickens increase, road crossings increase because of the balancing feedback loop. Uh, and, and we then took the, uh, the iceberg and made it into a reinforcing feedback loop, suggesting that perhaps if we're going to change structures, we need to change how we think about things and how we behave. And as those structures change, we will create new patterns of behavior. And what we want is people to behave differently. But as them to behave differently, Without shifting of mental models and making it easy, but recycling bins is really difficult. I ask you then to step back from the system stuff and apply it to your life. And I suggested that one person can make a difference, even with something as simple as a clothespin, provided that we're part of something bigger than ourselves. And I suggest that the myself, the I, is not the end of the story. We live in a world of radical individualism today. Uh, and, and, but I know that I'm part of something bigger than myself, a family self, community self, an eco-self in the sense that we're a part of, not apart from Mother Nature, and, apart, and perhaps even a cosmic or a divine self, if that's your choice. But at least to recognize that we don't end at the end of our fingertips, and our behaviors matter uh, in a positive and a negative way. Then we looked at flowers. We said seeds increase flowers, and flowers increase seeds. We took that out, and that was, I think, a fifth or a sixth grade class in Ithaca, New York, that created that model. And then we looked at Carl Norris' uh, suggestion that as biological health increases, um, uh, uh, fertility increases, or fertility increases, crop health, uh, uh, crop health increases. Uh, health, I mean, the biological health increases. Oh, that's a plus. I can't, can't see with my glass on. It's too close. So, <laughs> as biological health incre increases in the soil, fertility increases, um, uh, crop health increases, pesticide use goes down. And that was Kraft's model of a, the conventional way of looking about agriculture as a slowly moving disaster. We then talked about Liz Christie and how an intervention of an individual improving neighborhood quality can cause a reinforcing feedback loop. And we looked at the, the Rajasthan story, the Joe Rays, and how a, a group of people that don't know any better can start digging out Joe Rays and change the world. Then step back from the structural stuff and said, well, where, how does this fit in our larger thinking? How does this affect our mental models? And I took you to Paul 
uh, to Paul once again, Paul Crafell, and he is working way up high in the watershed. He's not trying to stop the Mississippi at the bottom of the Mississippi. He's, he's changing it way up high in the watershed with small changes that create huge changes over time through spirals of hope. Uh, and what we are familiar with, of course, is spirals of despair when we give up and quit. Uh, both of these cycles are reinforcing feedback loops that I believe exist in nature and in human species. <coughs> Took it another step up and looked at archetypes. And I introduced you to my friend of the local forest dilemma and suggested that you know a symptom of uh, a symptom can be fixed with a quick quick fix, quick fix, which changes the symptom but there's unintended consequences. And his solution of to uh, to poverty and everything else was uh, global food and suggested that local food was uh, a little bit of poison. Uh, it was was a har it was a horrible thing, and uh, without looking at unintended consequences, so we looked at the tragedy of the common, shifting the burden, escalation, and fixing the fail. I, can, I gave you a handout with uh, probably eight different archetypes that are part of the human story. And then we got engaged in this, uh, in this uh, the commodity system. This is where we were headed. Now understand the system that we're part of, and then how can we begin to shift it? And what are the problems with it? The problems with it we, we looked at last week. And you did a great job of identifying ways we could use our understanding of that commodity system to leverage change. The resource depletion trap, there were two, two, two discussion groups, so these are a combination of the two discussion groups, but suggesting that we could affect resource depletion largely by changing capacity, by, largely by reducing capacity. As you reduce capacity, you reduce harvest rate, and you save the resource level. That's hard to imagine today uh, in a world which uh, growth is everything, economic growth is everything, but economic growth is killing us. And so can we balance at least capacity uh, and balance harvest rates so we don't continue to collapse resources, whether it be fish or water or soil? Uh, and you had several suggestions. I thought they were really creative suggestions of where they fit in this model. Uh, the, the public health uh, trap, uh, you had a number of different suggestions, from school lunch and education to CSAs and taxing. Taxing, uh, subsidizing, and taxing. Um, taxing is hard. Education is easy. And I'm going to show you a, a graph here in a moment that suggests some of the easiest things to do are the least effective. They're important, but they're least effective. The harder things to do, like um, uh, raising uh, minimum wage and uh, capping production, uh, is much more difficult to do and yet necessary if we're going to change this system before it collapses. And then, of course, the community decline trap. What we're trying to do is maintain producers' income without and maintain the number of producers. What I'm going to show you today is a model, an example from California of a way of both increasing producers' income but also increasing the number of producers. Because if you don't have people on the landscape, it's hard to imagine effective communities. And so we've got to keep people on the landscape in small towns, in small communities, uh, in order to have vibrant uh, quality of life. And then all these suggestions help move us away from completely exploiting, um, uh, completely eliminating small farms and small shops and small businesses in favor of uh, Walmart and uh, big box stores. On Blackboard, well, here you are. Uh, Cam, you asked about this. Uh, if you look at the commodity systems quiz two and class, the tier, actually, this is the quiz two. Somebody asked about quiz two. It's still available, right, on Blackboard. Um, for those of you who want to continue to explore this model, I had a couple of questions after the discussion group suggesting that you had some curiosity. So, so, so hope you had curiosity about this. Um, I put up the full commodity system challenge, the full report. Uh, and so that's available in the commodity six systems week. If you look at class materials, there'll be a PowerPoint there. And it'll also be the full report. And you can look at what these experts have proposed to change this commodity system. And they had, they had um, suggestions where some were like yours and some were uh, other, other than yours. And so uh, that's available if you wanted to continue to dive into this commodity system. Because what we're after is shifting structures. And we really want to change structures because as structures change, patterns of behavior of humans move in the same direction. As patterns of behavior, if humans change their patterns of behavior, you build more, more sustainable structures. It can be a reinforcing feedback loop. It can be a spiral of hope. Um, but changing structures is really difficult without changing actions and mental models. Here are some of the structures that the uh, experts in that commodity system um, paper proposed. They suggested that the bottom here is easier and less effective. Things like environmental payments and social payments and local marketing. Local marketing is a way of stepping outside of the commodity system temporarily until the commodity system commodifies your local product. 
So you're constantly looking for new niches to get outside the system, and that's a, that's a, that's a hard course to, to continue. It doesn't really address the root cause of the problem, but it does put people outside of the, of the destruction of the commodity system, at least temporarily. Certification is a way of creating a niche market, so organic certification is a way of taking a carrot and making it a little bit more unique. And that has some effect. The real substantive changes have to happen at a, at a deeper level. And so they're suggesting harvest limits, for example, limiting the amount of fish you can, you can harvest before the, 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 uh, the fisheries collapse. And of course, we, we do that, but then we have problems with international boundaries and other countries not respecting that. Can you limit the harvest, the, the amount of corn that we produce so we don't, over, don't overproduce corn? Technology limiting agreements is a way of saying you can't have big fishing boats, you can't have big um, tractors, you can't have GMOs. Imagine that in order to, to put a balancing loop in the production cycle. And a minimum price. You know, you can actually create a minimum price for carrots to keep people in business. They do it in the tobacco industry. We do it in the milk industry. Um, there are some areas where we've, we've created those kind of minimum price limits to maintain uh, people in business. And they're more difficult, but they're hard, and they're harder to do, but they have more, more influence on the core drivers, those three system drivers. And so that paper is available for you. In order to change structures, we've got to change individual actions. So our work, I propose, is, you know, the clothespin story, is to check individual actions, small, little, small things that can make a difference, and shifting mental models through reframing. If we can do both of those things, changing our behavior and to change the way we think, uh, the structures will come, uh, the structures will follow. So the reframing thing, I want to remind you of the reframing uh, tool. We start with beliefs. I believe we're part of, not apart from, Mother Nature. I believe we need to build structures and patterns of behavior based on respect for each other and, and, and Mother Nature. I believe we're part of something bigger than ourselves. So that myself is part of a family self, a community self, an eco self. That I'm not alone, and if I, if I take advantage of you, I'm taking advantage of us. Adam Smith wrote, um, what's Adam Smith's book? Uh, about capitalism, I lost it. Oh my God, you don't know what uh, the wealth, wealth of nations? Wealth of nations, right? 1800s. Yeah, Adam Smith chronicled capitalism as it was emerging, uh, as it was being developed. And Adam Smith's theory of capitalism was that there, there, you can have economic competition, and that will keep the marketplace active, and the best, the best producer will, will benefit. Um, but Adam Smith lived, lived, lived in a time when there were two things we don't have now. One, a sense of right and wrong. Adam Smith had a god in the church that would punish you if you did bad things. And two, you had to know the people you were dealing with. Even if you were dealing across the, across the world, you had a personal relationship with those people. It's hard to beat, to, to screw somebody twice, you know, if you have a personal relationship. Today, there is no sense of right and wrong. The only sense of right and wrong is getting caught. It feels wrong. Uh, and, and we don't know the people who are selling us junk. Uh, or we don't have a personal relationship. And so Amazon can, you know, Fool us again and again and again. Adam Smith had to live in a different kind of world, and his understanding of capitalism um, was very different than our, our uh, extreme capitalism today, unregulated extreme capitalism. We, the reason we add regulations is because we've grown to a point we don't know each other, and we don't have a sense of right and wrong, um, seemingly in the political world anyway. So I start with a belief, and I talk about reasonable change options. You know, I tell stories. And, and with that, you know, I believe we can change the story from one of cynicism, destructiveness, and irresponsibility, not by saying don't think of an elephant or don't be bad or don't do that, but to suggest there's other ways of, of being and, and behaving and structures you can build around uh, ideas, big ideas like hope, like fairness, like responsibility. This is the one I want to show you today. Another uh, two big ideas, one from the East Coast and one from the West, based on different kind of mental models that I believe when you push the good stuff in, the crap comes out the other side, we have a chance. Out with the old and with the new. And here's the first one. We need a mental model. We need a set of values and interrelated belief systems um, that can build a, a, a food system based on uh, a, shared, a shared common good. Um, this is a vision that came out of the New England state. Anybody ever heard of the New England food vision? Have you, Jack, where did you hear about that? You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is six New England states that have suggested that we need to, their slogan is 50 by 60. 
In New England, there's a commitment among six New England states and the participants that 50% of our food in New England, produced in New England by 2060. 50 by 60 is 50% by 2060. Imagine the Hudson River didn't have any bridges. If the Hudson River didn't have any bridges, we would be almost an island. If you stop rolling the trucks and bringing the ships into port, we have three days worth of food on the shelf. That's not a very resilient system. It's not a system that's, that's designed to <laughs> respond to difficulties. Uh, if, the, if the bridges on the Hudson River were gone, we would be hungry in three days. If close the airports and close the seaports. Um, we believe that at least 50% of our food can be grown in England, in, in New England, uh, and create a more vibrant food economy. The authors of this, this came from um, Brian Donahue, who was a professor at uh, Brandeis. Brandeis. Uh, he now lives up in Northfield, and he started his own little sustainable farm. But he wrote, uh, he did a study with a number of academics from eastern Massachusetts on the New England food system and suggested that the rates of in food insecurity have escalated in the six New England states over the last 20, 50, 20, 20 to 30, 40 years. Food insecurity is a sense of you don't really know where your next, where your next meal is coming from. It's not poverty. It's not out-and-out out hunger. It's a sense that we really don't have a sense of that where our food's coming from. Food insecurity is documentedly rising in New England. Dietary patterns are contributing to illness, uh, heart disease, lung disease, um, you know, diabetes. The way we eat, the things that we eat are contributing to uh, a public health crisis. And the land ownership in the food sector, people of color and minorities are excluded for the, large, for the, large, for the most part from the New England food system. And they've suggested that these three attributes of the system suggest it's not working as well as it could. Rather than trashing the food system, we say, well, you know what? We produce a lot of food. It's relatively cheap for most people. Uh, but we have some problems. We can do better. We can do better by addressing the food insecurity of, the many, of many people, um, by looking at the kind of foods we eat and to make sure that the diversity of social interest in, in the food system as well as um, a diversity of products. The New England, print, the New England uh, food system was based on two principles. One, that food is a powerful determinant. We can actually change the world by changing how we think about food. Food is so much part of our lives and so much part of our culture that food is a leverage point for changing culture. Second thing is New Englanders can pursue a future in which food systems benefit all. There's a belief here that suggests it does not have to be exploited, exploitative. It can benefit all. That's an assumption. I don't know if it's true, but it's an assumption upon which this, 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 this proposal is based. 50 by 60, 50% 50 regional food by 2060. The assumptions are in making this, uh, this, this proposal is that first of all, we will begin to choose healthy foods. And the way they describe healthy foods is not necessarily you know, vegan or vegetarian. It's simply using the food pyramid or the food, the food plate of the USDA. Simply by using the food suggestion of the USDA, which is not terribly radical, folks. You know? It's reducing your meat consumption, eating more greens, eating more you know, bean, uh, uh, legume-based uh, uh, proteins. Uh, we would uh, we need to do that. If we can't do that, then this proposal doesn't work. We have to change our diets. Energy costs will continue to rise, but we will make an effort to reduce our carbon footprint. There's still going to be transportation, but if you can provide uh, more product locally, we can reduce our carbon footprint and not have so much stored and, 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 uh, and frozen foods. We will choose to protect 70% of the current wild lands and the woodlands in New England. There was a time in southern New England where there weren't any trees left. If you go up in the Mohawk Trail, prior to about 1830, there was a small stand of trees in the steepest, steepest slope, and the rest of western Massachusetts was grazed for sheep. There were no trees. Um, today, we have, after the Civil War and people moved to the to Midwest, um, trees came back. We've got forests. And Brian Donahue and his friends believe that's an important part of our culture, that we can't go back to eliminating the trees. Uh, but that we can protect 70% of the wildlands, the wetlands, uh, the river systems, and the woodlands, and still produce a lot more of our food. But we will need to decide to have more integrated farms. These are farms like you have studied in sustainable agriculture class, like Simple Gifts, that has a, uh, a vegetable culture and, a, and an animal culture, so you can cycle nutrients. You know, The three principles of um, ecological being are one is power needs to be solar power. And preferably, that solar power needs to be fresh solar power <laughs> from the sun or in trees, not ancient solar power that's currently stored in the ground as coal. All power needs to be solar power. And you know, the movement of rivers is solar powered. The movement of wind is solar powered. But that's where we need to get our energy from. The second 
uh, attribute of an ecologically sustainable system is that everything material cycles. The bumper sticker version of that is waste equals food. Waste equals food is an ecological principle. There's only two things in the universe, energy and matter. Energy must be solar and energy must be cycled. But to make that happen, you have to have biologically diverse systems. Simple systems, 1,000 acres of corn, will not achieve those two first, this first two functions. And so biological diversity, including integrated farming systems, the crops and livestock, is necessary for this vision to, be, to occur. Now, I don't know if we can achieve, achieve all these. I don't know if we're willing to change our diet. I don't know if we're willing to curb our energy costs. I think we're probably willing to, to protect our woodlands and wildlands. And I'm not sure if we're going to be ready to support integrated farms because big uh, livestock CAFOs and hog facilities in the Carolinas and the West are cheaper. They produce a cheaper, cheap, a lower priced product, but a more costly product environmentally and socially. Those are assumptions that, the, that uh, were set up as the, as the uh, prerequisites for this vision. And then, if we could do this, we can expand farmland in New England by threefold. About 15% of farmland in New England. Some of it's on the river bottoms producing vegetables, some of it on, on the hills uh, producing uh, uh, sheep and goats and cows, beef cows. Bringing up our, current, our, um, our farmland up to about 6 million acres from the current about 2 million acres in New England. Uh, that's the same as 1945, folks. You know, this is not going back to the 1830s. This is something that right after World War II, we had about 15% of New England in food, in, in food, food production. If we could do that, we could grow most of our vegetables, half of our fruits and juices, most of our dry beans, and all of our dairy, most of our beef and lamb and grass in the, uh, in the hillsides. This is a possibility um, for New England. It's a vision to suggest, you know what, we could do this. What we need to do is choose healthy diets, curb our energy consumption, and decide to have more integrated farms, not monoculture farms. But that's a possibility. This is a possibility. This, is, this is suggests we import about 50% of our fruits and juices uh, most of our grain, feed grain, um, to feed the livestock because it doesn't make a lot of sense to grow um, uh, grain, which can be shipped um, by train relatively cheaply and can be stored. It doesn't make sense to, to, to grow a lot of grain in New England when it's not really the kind of environment for grain. We have some um, um, commercial uh, uh, wheat, local wheat, and, and there are scientists trying to develop, redevelop wheat, wheat varieties for New England. I think it's really cool, but that's for a local bread product. That's not the feed to the chickens. We can bring product from the Midwest. We're going to be grown in the West. We can grow a lot more cheaply and ship relatively um, energy efficiently um, to bring grain and vegetable oil from places where, they're, where they're, uh, they can be grown better. You've got to bring your peanuts, coffee, tea, chocolate, and sugar because we're not going to be without those things. So we've got to ship some things. This is not a radical vision, extremely radical vision. Uh, it is a substantive change, however, that these people are proposing. But the key assumptions are we change our diet and we support integrated farms. If we're going to support monoculture farms, this doesn't work. If we're going to continue to eat a factory farm beef and chicken and pork, this is not going to work. But what they propose is a vision that goes way beyond food. It's about democratic empowerment of people. This is a movement, this is a, a suggestion, this has been... Many, many people have participated in creating this vision uh, from all walks of life and, and a huge social diversity of folks that have participated. But this is about economic sustainability. This is about uh, de democratic empowerment. This is about new leaders emerging, young people emerging. In New England, the fastest growing demographic, according to the last USDA census, was women-owned farms. Women-owned farms is the fastest growing farm category in New England. Um, that suggests that things can change. There's new leadership on the horizon. You can see it in our own major uh, of, of uh, the, the, the diversity of folks that come to our major. This vision suggests by 2060, we can grow 50% of our food, 50% of our land, land area in food. Changes in food production, distribution, and consumption are all possible. These are new structures. And I want to show you some examples of what those structures might look like conceptually. And I'll give you a few examples of how they're beginning to emerge from the landscape. But we're going to change the vision. And we're going to change the, the structures so that the food system begins to shift our cultural awareness and our, our, our awareness of um, our relative um, rela our re relationships with other people and with the land. The economic socio-economic implications of this proposal, um, more food viability, more of a regional economic food viability, you know? Uh, more stuff, more production, more markets, a more vibrant local economy. Requires livable wages for all. We can't continue to exploit 
people who are um, uh, who don't have opportunities uh, to go to college, for example. It's it's uh, part of a sustainable system needs to needs to embrace social equity and social justice if it's going to last. Uh, closer connection from producer consumer, so we know where our food's coming from. We know the people and the families that are producing our food. Enhance access to land and equitable capital. I'll show you a proposal for that. Um, but we've got to provide access to people who no longer, who don't have access today. It's almost impossible to buy land in the Pioneer Valley because it's too expensive. But you can get access to land through conservation commissions. You can rent it from local towns and villages. Um, th there is land available in northern New England at a less, uh, lesser price. But there are really creative ways to provide land. The North Amherst Community Farm, which I'll tell you about in a minute, the, the home of simple gifts, is one way to recognize that land values are high in this region, and yet we still want farms. Uh, we need to provide access to land and capital. And that dignity is important, that access to food is for all. Well, the the, uh, real, the uh, Food Solutions in New England have, on several occasions, um, created a racial equity challenge of suggesting how is it that we live in a world and to look at our privileges um, and, our, and our challenges um, through the eyes of, of racial minorities um, who created a program. This is a big idea. This is a shift in mental models that, if, in, if embraced, will begin to shift structures. I'd ask you to have a look at the New England Food Vision. And some of the outcome of that, some of the structures that have come from that, have been proposed in the Massachusetts Food Policy Council. Anybody here of the Massachusetts Food Policy Council? Anybody takes Catherine Sands' course? Has she talked about the Food Policy Council? She's very active in this. It's a, so look up Massachusetts Food Policy Council. You want to know where the action is and create new structures for, to, to achieve these goals? It happens at the Massachusetts Food Policy Council that Catherine Sands is very much part of. And, and there's a series of, I don't know what it is, 20 pages of recommendations, the committees that might address them, and, and recommendations of how to shift uh, these structures. So Farming Action 2.2.3, establish a state livestock care and standards board so that we don't abuse livestock. Each one of these recommendations comes out of a, a different vision, a vision of sustainability and wholeness. So, and that policy council is not an implementation council. It's a group of people that, have, that come from all over the state, appointed by the governor, to suggest how we're going to be creatively think about the food system of the future. This is happening in New England today. If you want to learn more about that, it's food solutions NE for New England org. And I think what they have proposed is a fairly exciting um, idea with some, with some legs. We've got to shift mental models. We've got to shift vision. And we've got to believe that this is possible. The second visionary document, the visionary proposal I want to share with you is called the Food Commons. This comes from the West Coast. Uh, Larry Yee uh, used to work for the University of California, uh, an old friend of mine um, who suggested, in California particularly, where the food where the industrial food system is so dominant um, that they influence policy, they influence, influence the kinds of research that are happening at the, at the public institutions. They're very, very powerful. Um, in New England, we don't have that kind of a powerful industrial uh, agricultural lobby. But we're able to do creative things. Uh, in much of the country where agriculture is a big economic interest, they influence things like what happens in classrooms uh, in, in the University of California, Davis. Um, I was working in Illinois up till when I leave, 1992. Um, I created an agroecology program at the University of Illinois in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. And uh, the dean that I worked for was invited. I was invited by the lieutenant governor to leave the state. He did not want me in the state because I was raising questions about using ecological principles to understand agricultural systems. And it caused great discomfort. The dean, to his credit, um, gave me a raise. He said, no, keep doing what you're doing. Um, but the state government, influenced by corporate lobbyists and the Farm Bureau, wanted me out of there. Uh, I eventually left because I wanted to come home to New England. Um, but there was a lot of political pressure not to do the kind of things that you get to do at University of Massachusetts because we don't have that political force, those, those industrial um, voices. Uh, California does. And so this is a really difficult thing to do in California. And yet, Fresno is trying to implement the vision as described by the Food Commons. I want to tell you about the food commons. Larry says, uh, he quotes, quotes Buckminster Fuller and says, uh, you never really change things by fighting the existing reality. Don't think of an elephant is not going to work. We've got to replace our mental models with a new vision of hope and responsibility. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. We can point out, hey, that's not working. Why don't we try this? 
hey, the, you know, the, indu the industrial chicken products we buy here down in Stop and Shop are really cheap. Um, and the, input, the, the, the traps that come with that system are all part of the commodity system. Um, going up to Simple Gifts and buying chicken is an alternative model. He suggests that the food commons will have three components. These are the three components of the food commons. There will be a food trust, which I'll tell you about, a food hub, and a food bank. This food bank is not a food bank where you get food. This is a food bank where you get money, capital investments. These three have to all exist together. Currently, we're seeing around the country investments in food hubs, and I'll show you why. The food commons comes at this from a whole, much more holistic place, saying, you know what, the land is important, the food is important, and the money is important. And what we'll do is we'll shift all of these components by investing in the common good. The Food Commons Bank would provide financial services to small lenders, to small, uh, uh, small producers, and small consumers, or small um, retailers. Uh, financial services for which the return on investment did not go back to shareholders and corporate investments, but, but the turn, return on investment would reinvest in the community. When you lend money out, you can charge interest. You can make money for that, but that money then can be reinvested back in community rather than uh, going off to the uh, Bank of America. The Food Commons hubs would aggregate and distribute food. We're seeing some of that around here. We're seeing small producers coming together that, that they can't get into big marketplaces because you don't produce enough carrots to get into a big marketplace on a regular basis. Uh, and so, and they can't pack often because they don't have a packing shed that'll handle the, the kind of product delivery system that they, they're required by the food stores. And so you aggregate. You bring things together and you work together and you ship together as an aggregate. Uh, aggregate and distribute through a food hub is something that's happening all around the country, particularly in areas where there are a lot of small farmers with, with, with some uh, economic viability. Now I'll show you what that looks like. The Food Commons Trusts would invest in helping people own farmland. In a place like Amherst, Massachusetts, where land is so expensive, it never comes on the marketplace for agricultural land, um, we need to figure out ways of, of acquiring that land uh, and keeping it in agriculture um, so that we have the infrastructure to produce food locally. Here's a food hub. The idea is that we take lots and lots of different kinds of foods, we run it through a food hub, informed by the, com the uh, commitment to the common good, informed by a trust and a bank, and then deli delivered out to places where they have demand. It can be done very, very efficiently. This is a food hub. Rather than one uh, cow producer selling to one restaurant over here, we're going through a food hub to improve efficiency. This is what our systems, our food systems looked like prior to World War II. Lots and lots of small producers dealing with lots and lots of small vendors, shops and restaurants. And it was very inefficient. It was very personal. Um, and there were a lot of small producers involved. Um, but it was relatively inefficient. Today, this is what our system looks like. looks like large producers and large supermarkets and institutions. Uh, very, very efficient. That is the result of the commodity, the commodity system. Very, very efficient. Low cost of food, lots of production, lots of food around, um, but not a lot of growers, not a lot of producers, not a lot of small, uh, small, small businesses. So what the Food Hub does, it addresses at least part of that problem. It suggests that we can keep a lot of small producers in business by aggregating the product and helping them ship together. So they can ship into UMass, they can ship um, to Stop and Shop, they can ship to the Big Y, they can ship to um, uh, the big box stores. That's half of the solution. And that's not a bad idea. And we're seeing some of that around the country developing uh, because these small producers are coming together and they're cooperating and they're working together. It requires a commitment to cooperation. In 1975 or something like that, um, the, the, uh, there was a, a cooperative created in Western Massachusetts, um, out in uh, Hatfield. Anybody know the name of it? I can't remember the name of it. It was a food, a food co-op where they were going to come together, the small producers were going to come together and ship into Boston because they could then aggregate their food product, uh, run it through a hydro cooler, and put it in a box and send it to Boston. And what happened was they weren't desperate enough to actually make a full commitment. They didn't have contracts with each other that, that imagined a full commitment. What they did was they had excess product they sent down to the food co-op and their best product they sent directly to consumers. So they're always sending their junk into the food hub. That won't work. There needs to be a commitment to something bigger than just sending in the excess product. This requires a commitment to the common good. Without that, this, this is uh, just more commodification. So the Food Commons suggested that a lot of people are at the table, that a lot of people can participate and a lot of people will benefit. And the suggestion is 
that by not creating a single location where we, can, where we aggregate our product, but create a communication system that improves the connection between the small producers and the small shops. We can imagine a network, uh, a, a computer-driven network that suggests that, oh, you've got this over here, I need this over here, there's a transportation, there's a truck going your way, and let's make this happen. This is a, a, an idea um, a, of a different kind of a, uh, of a system, a network system, that the hub is not a physical place, it could be small physical, small physical places, but uh, it's basically a communications network that improves the connection. Because this person uh, in, uh, in Hatfield does not know um, this uh, grocery store in Holyoke. You know, and it's really difficult to know all the pop hustle of vendors. This communication hub developed by a, 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 a network communication system is an imagined, uh, is an imagined uh, a vision for the, uh, the food commons. But it's got to be held together by common values. If it's not a commitment to values, if there's not a mental model driving this, that becomes a structure that simply becomes commodified and people take advantage of over time. Uh, we've got to believe, make a commitment, a contractual commitment to common values. And so the, common, the, the food commons suggests that fairness and stewardship, economic opportunity, all the things that we associate with sustainability are part of this, this vision. Food sovereignty is a suggestion that we actually control our own destiny with respect to food. There's a town in Maine, which I'm not remembering the name of it, but they passed a local bylaw. It's called a Food Sovereignty Bylaw. It suggests that all state and federal laws that contributed to the commodity system were no longer appropriate for our town. I can't think of the town's name. Which is completely illegal. You can't do that. Uh, but they did. They passed a local bylaw to make a point that suggests, you know, within our town boundaries, we have our own food sovereignty. We can control our own destiny. We can set our own prices, and we can make our own policies to disadvantage the global food system. Um, they'll be in the courts for years because local government doesn't have that kind of power. Um, but wouldn't it be neat if local government was able to create that kind of a, a infrastructure? Food sovereignty, uh, at least at the national level, suggests that we can control our own destiny. Integration of crops and livestock, transparency, so we know where our food's coming from, we know what it's costing, and we know what people are making on it. Ethics, accountability are all part of this vision that they're going to call the commons. We live in the commonwealth of Massachusetts. That commonwealth could include food, if we believed it. And this system exists. It exists in Chinatown in New York City. In Chinatown in New York City, there's a lot, a lot of local vendors, a lot, a lot of product. They have a globalized, personal aggregation and distribution system. They know each other by phone calls and by, by, by who, you're, who you're married to. And this system actually has been documented in Chinatown in New York City. This was done by a professor from Cornell who wrote a book called From Farm to Canal Street. Canal Street is where Chinatown begins. Where I used to go down when I was a kid. I'd take the train in and buy firecrackers for 4th of July and go to Canal Street. Um, I never paid attention to the produce, but there are lots and lots of produce markets. Uh, and this is uh, my Google Maps uh, of uh, some of the produce mac markets in, uh, in uh, Chinatown in New, York, in New York City. I want to read this to you. This was right out of the book. was mind-boggling. The way Chinatown produces food demonstrates another kind of globalization, one that does not threaten regional economies. It does not homogenize cultures. It is not controlled by big corporations. Chinatown's food system embodies a global economic network that is constructed by people who may have been marginalized, but instead are carving out their own are carving out their own global niche in an economic network based on culture and biological um, specificities that people are involved in. People, they, this is a sense of place, a sense of who we are, a sense of culture, uh, and a personal sense of connections. This is exists today. This is what used to exist all over the world, uh, and has been homogenized and destroyed. So we take this communications network idea. And in Chinatown, what they've done is they've put personal relationships in place of the communications network. They still use phone systems. They still use email. They still use text messages. Um, but it's based on a common values because people know each other. That system is a food commons. It's the best example of a food commons I can find. Uh, it exists today, suggesting that it's not impossible. The food commons uh, would connect you know, regional small producers <laughs> in the South with small uh, vendors in the South, with small vendors in, in the Northwest, with each other. This is, not an, this is not an isolationist strategy. This is a globalization by networking, maintaining the smallness 
of individual producers and maintaining strong sense of community, either through a communications network, which could not have happened 20 years ago, but today we have the technology to do, or a personal network that exists today among some cultures. This is a viable possibility. This has been proposed um, by Larry and his friends in California and has been, has been taken up as a founding principle by the city of Fresno and how they think about the environment and the food systems. The Food Commons includes food land trusts, uh, food distribution, and food investment. And we, if you look at, if you look at the Pioneer Valley of Western Massachusetts, and say, and you go home at Thanksgiving and you tell your family about it, the response, for at least Rob, is Rob here, the response from your family is going to see that's crazy, right? So here we have using the upside down iceberg uh, for you, Rob. Okay, we're going to suggest. In the Pioneer Valley of Western Massachusetts, something is possible. Well, did you know that there's already a food, a, a land trust in the Pioneer, there's several land trusts actually. The one I'm involved in is called the North Amherst Community Farm. The North Amherst Community Farm came together about seven or eight years ago and found out that the farm that Simple Gifts was being, the, the land that Simple Gifts was being farmed on, is, is, is farming on now, was up for sale. And the developer offered the family a million six. Um, a land trust was formed, a nonprofit land trust was formed called the North Amherst Community Farm. We bought that land for a million three. We got all sorts of donations, lots and lots of people. Uh, we bought that land and we created a, uh, a long term contract for Simple Gifts Farm, which is a commercial for profit business on um, public lands, publicly owned trust lands. This is happening all throughout the country. When you can't afford to farm in Amherst, you have two choices. One is not farming in Amherst any longer and not having that, that local connection. Uh, we're doing something about it, and a land trust is another way of, of uh, approaching that. Uh, those of you who've been up to Seed Solidarity, Deb and Rick uh, bought that land from a land trust. I forget the name of it, um, but it was relatively inexpensive land. They didn't have any money, and so they got help from a land trust who, who helped them buy that property. This is an example of a food commons trust. Yesterday morning's paper, I'm going through the paper, and I'm reading about the Common Good Bank um, in Greenfield. I'm a member of the Common Good Bank. I don't actually use it because their credit card is actually mostly good up in Greenfield. But this is a bank uh, in Greenfield, Massachusetts, that will take investors and create credit cards. And you can use that credit card to buy things at certain establishments in, in Western Massachusetts. You can borrow money from that bank. Um, and the, the return on investment, the interest that comes back, is then invested back in the community, not just in food, but in small local businesses in Greenfield, Massachusetts. This is yesterday's paper talking about the Common Good Bank. It's an example of a food, not just simply food, but a commons bank. The, uh, Berkshire's uh, dollars uh, is a, another example in Western Massachusetts. Uh, there are um, local dollars that can be used to reinvest in local, in local businesses. Um, we're seeing this appearing around the country. And a food hub. Uh, anyone been, been down to Joe Zakowski's place in Hadley here? Or Wally Zakowski's um, Plainfield Farm? So. Um, Within sight of this building, if you can see it through the other buildings, uh, Joe um, is about a third generation Polish family. The Polish families came into Western Massachusetts. It was a, it was a, revol it was a revolution, a revolt in Poland uh, in 1905, I believe, and a, then a reestablishment of the monarchy, uh, a very oppressive uh, government, and many people left. Many of the Polish people, the farmers, came into Western Massachusetts and worked as farm workers around 1900. Um, by the 20s and the 30s, they had saved enough money to start buying land from the original, original English settlers uh, and shifted the food culture um, based on a common culture and common heritage. The families in Western and down in Hadley, um, land never comes up for rent because if, you're, if, if, you're, if you have land, I have land, I've grown tomatoes and you've grown wheat, uh, next year it makes a whole lot of sense for us to, to just trade, you know? And sometimes by contracts, sometimes, sometimes by handshakes, uh, people will just trade, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 acres because they know the families that live down the street because they're neighbors and have been part of the same heritage for a long, long time. Joe has done something really creative. He, grow, he created Lakeside Organics, but he also has his Joe Sikowski farm. He grows both organic and non-organic. Um, and what he'll do is he'll aggregate for small growers. He's got a big packing shed. Um, he was lucky enough, he and his brother Wally uh, were lucky enough, their father had uh, enough land both sons created businesses. Both created big packing sheds, shipping to the big Y, and um, and they are uh, they're major shippers. 
They, they have a big market uh, at UMass. Uh, we buy a lot of their product. But they also buy from small producers. They buy from a lot of small producers. They aggregate their product. So somebody who's growing a couple acres of carrots can actually sell a couple of acres of carrots of the product to Joe, who put them in boxes, make them look like <laughs> all the other carrots, because they've got to look the same in a box when they go to the major food channels and ship it over to UMass. When, um, when he started doing this, maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, people were confused. Why would you bother doing something for your neighbors? Why would you bother helping your neighbors out? Why don't you just buy their land and put them out of business? And it came from a cultural, uh, a culture of sharing and working with each other. Uh, that, that wasn't part of their mental models. That, 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 the, the, uh, the dominant English culture in New England was very cutthroat. Um, the Polish culture, as it came into this country in the early part of the 20th century, uh, had different core values. And, and those core values are evident today if you know some of these farm families um, in, in Hadley. He helped his neighbors out. He helped himself out. He's got a packing chain. He's got to keep it busy. Uh, and so he brings in product from other people and repacks it for small producers and sells it to, to UMass. And he sells a lot of product to UMass. So that's a food hub. It's not the distribution part of the food hub. It's the aggregation part of the food hub. And it's, a, it's a partial step. Each of these examples contributes to what I would call the foods commons here in Western Massachusetts. And so when Rob's sitting around the table with his family and they say, you know, you're crazy, we can say, you know what, there's things that are happening in some parts of the world that you may not be aware of that are kind of interesting. Here in the Pioneer Valley, there's a food commons that is beginning to emerge, just individual examples um, that are starting to emerge. But those commons will be susceptible to the tragedy of the commons if they're based on a mental model of competition. If they're not based on a mental model of sharing, of participating in each other's lives, um, then the tragedy of the commons will put them out of business. If I've got a small business that's successful, as soon as somebody else comes along and can do it cheaper than me, uh, and, and uh, I would pull, I'll be put out of business. And so copycats will always commodify uh, product uh, aggregation and delivery unless the system is based on a sense of common good. Unless we see ourselves as something big, bigger than, big, we are part of something bigger than ourselves. If I am simply a myself and maybe I'll take care of my family uh, at all costs, then, I, then I'm okay with taking advantage of you. If I'm part of something bigger than myself, if I truly believe that, remember that video uh, of how evolution happened and life appeared on the planet? If we truly believe that we are stardust come to life, then, well, then we're related. We're related through evolutionary processes. This is, this is biology, you know, this is, this is not religion, this is biology, we're part of something bigger than ourselves. If we choose to believe it. So your assignment, in lieu of a little class on Thursday, if to tell your family <laughs> about the food commons, you know? Tell them about the things that are happening in uh, some parts of the world. There are three hot spots for sustainable agriculture in the world, right here in the Pioneer Valley of Western Massachusetts, not because UMass is here, by the way, uh, but because of the common culture uh, and the, and the, uh, the way uh, the agriculture emerged here. Uh, Eugene, Oregon, that area of Oregon, and Southern California, San Diego, San, up to Santa Cruz, there are three hot spots that are really active in these kind of thinking. Reframe this. So Uncle Teddy at dinner says, you know, wasn't it great how the whole world was watching and praying for those 12 kids with the soccer coach trapped in the cave in Thailand just last summer? Kind of gives you faith in humanity, you know? And that is a feel-good thing. The whole world was watching, you know? Your response, Rob, is that's true. And wouldn't it be great if we showed the same concern for the 30 to 40,000 children that die every day to malnutrition, hunger, and preventable diseases. Wouldn't it be nice if that same good feeling that we attribute to those 12 kids, you know, I want to share it with the rest of us, the world. I want to share it with people who are dying. Hunger, malnutrition, diseases that can be cleaned up with sanitation and clean food. You know, my mental model suggests that that matters because I'm part of something bigger than myself. If we're starting to come to life, if people are dying, I'm part of it. And you could choose not to be part of it. But my mental model suggests, and even in Western Massachusetts, 10% of the household are in, in food insecure. Let's take it home. Right where we live, 10% of the household in Western Massachusetts is still food insecure. And given the abundance, Uncle Teddy, 
of uh, resources in this country. This is a great country. Let's feed, let's feed their ego. This is a great country. Because it really is. We've got tremendous resources, natural resources compared to the rest of the world. Tremendous infrastructure, tremendous medical, lots and lots of things that are being commodified very fast. But lots and lots of basic resources, you know? I think all that is wonderful. And I think we can do better. I'm not going to trash your vision of the way of life you have. I'm going to suggest, you know what? I think we can do better. We're going to begin to shift mental models by talking about a belief system that can be perhaps heard. With the food commons, I'm going to talk about being part of something bigger than myself. That there are examples of the food commons, you know? I'm going to share reasonable change options like food New, in, uh, New England food system, uh, <laughs> New England food vision, you know? I'm going to suggest the different patterns, things that are happening in the world, like a major, in which when I created the first sustainable ag major here in 2001, maybe, we had five students. Now we got 100. Two years ago, we had 150. Um, we've graduated a whole lot off. Something's going on right here in your lives, in your major. Um, they will call Yes Farms, Yes Food. There's shifts happening. There are people coming to learn about this stuff. And of course, it needs to be an action. I don't know what Uncle Teddy's action needs to be, but it needs to be an action, something you can do, something you reasonably could do um, that doesn't blow his mind, that suggests that uh, you know maybe we could uh, participate in this. Uh, for me, you know, um, I used to raise chickens in my backyard. I raised five turkeys to give away to my family members because they love my turkey. First of all, I like giving it, giving it free, you know. Um, but those are better turkeys that I raised than any, any butterball that could buy, you know. And by gifting my family, my, my brothers and my, my parents, you know, with a, with a turkey. But sometimes I had to cook for them because they weren't very good at that. But that's all right. <laughs> By a simple action, that's, that's the close to an action, you know. We begin to talk about some of the things that I truly value. We've come a long way in this class. And I just wanted to wrap it up today, before the holidays, with these understanding that these, these things are happening. You can choose to participate I, in, in the great turning, uh, we could choose to ignore it. You know, my invitation is choose to participate. We've gone from chickens crossing the roads. We're understanding a commodif commodification system. It is killing us and killing our planet. We've got suggestions or other ways to work. We've got examples, all based on different mental models. If we don't adopt the mental models, if we don't see ourselves as part of something bigger than ourselves, none of this makes any sense. And God love you. Go to Stop and Shop and Big Y and. Uh, Came, uh, Walmart's got 20% of their food product got, uh, is organic today. Uh, it's a commodified industrial organic, but nevertheless, it's organic. Um, if we believe in the food commons, um, we might have a chance of uh, reframing our lives and reframing our family's lives. Last announcement. No class on Thursday. I'm not going to be here. Don't you come here, right? Enjoy the holiday. A um, couple of homework assignments. I'll see you after Thanksgiving. Thank you for your attention. Now is when we get up, we go away. <laughs> unless, you're in, unless you're in the next class, right? <laughs> we got a dialogue coming up. Thanks, folks. <laughs>